Hello everybody, it's time for this week's Q&A. Um, obviously, as I've said before, I have to film these a bit before Sunday, so if you've asked a question that went on too late, uh, you won't have got in. Uh, also, again, I've had loads of questions, another two pages worth, uh, with quite small font. I didn't bother counting them up this time, but again, I assume it's going to be somewhere between 30 and 40 questions, I'd imagine. Um, so, again, sorry if your uh, question didn't get answered. Some people, as I said on the last video, I did try and answer on their actual question, because sometimes it wouldn't really be practical to talk about it in a video, uh, just simply because it would be like a one-word answer and then on to the next question. So, where well, that's been the case, I've answered it. Also, if I've done videos on things before, I've just told people to look up that video rather than, you know, ask it again as a question. Um, and that's something I do want to try and stress to people is I don't want to sound like a dick saying it But it's a bit annoying when people keep asking questions. I've answered loads of times So, you know search my channel first and then you should find a video on something if you don't then ask for it um, Rather than you know without bothering to look at anything just say you should do a video on this when I've already done several videos on that um, So let's get on to the list if you notice any weird cuts in the camera it's simply because what I have to do when I do these is cut the video every now and then, um, start and stop the camera, because otherwise the camera will start splicing the files weirdly, and you'll get like audio cut out or the video cut out. So what I'm going to do now is start and stop the camera, then we'll get on with the list. Okay, Sweaty Alcoholic says, where can I buy stab proof armour? Like legit armour, that's why I've got this one on in the video. Um, you can actually get stab proof armour off of eBay, actually proper armour. Um, lots of ex-police stuff is sold on eBay or ex-army stuff, um, that's where I've got this from. This is um, an old British police style vest carrier and it has a level 2 um, Kevlar thing in the front, level 2 Kevlar in the back and both of them have like the chainmail kind of stab stuff on. Um, so where can you buy stab proof armour? There will be sites that specialise in the brand new stuff but you can buy the second hand stuff. With stab proof, you can buy stuff that has stab proof panels in, which are like pretty much impossible for any blade to get through, even something like a Fairbind Sykes. Um, what I've got the Kevlar, it's very hard to get something that isn't like a designated ice pick or like the Bolts Tumbo made for me with the um, like armor piercing heads. Um, so this is you know good enough armor for what you'd probably want, but if you did want something more specialized, there are sites. Um, a vest like this, if you're buying a second hand one, you can get for 40 quid. Uh, with the front and rear panels uh, and the carrier however if you start going into more specialised stuff then that will cost you a lot more uh, unless you want to make homemade stuff but yeah as I said there will be specialised sites but I just look on eBay because often you get the same places selling the stuff for a bit cheaper on eBay because they want to try and get more people to see it and buy it um, so yeah check eBay first then just google like stab proof armour and you should find sites selling it in whatever country you're in and everything else b and Craft says, do you own any real lethal guns? No, all I've got is the two air rifles in my gun safe. I've got the deactivated guns, but they're not obviously lethal. Unless I put a bayonet on and stab some of them, then they'd be pretty lethal. I've got the crossbows, which are definitely lethal, but they're not guns. Um, so I do have a gun safe. I could definitely apply for a gun license, but in all honesty, I don't want to keep paying... Um, like the yearly or whatever it is every couple of years, pay the fee. Uh, I don't particularly want to have the police poking their noses into what I do a bit more. Not that I do anything dodgy, but you know, I don't want them, you know, to be on even more lists of things potentially. Uh, so, no. If the gun laws are a bit more relaxed um, and you didn't really have to provide proof of why you want a gun, um, you know, I'd probably just get a gun for that sake. But because you know you can't really own a handgun or something practical and carry it on you have not really seen the point when I have plenty of other tools as you probably seen on my channel that could dispatch somebody fairly easily if that you know if it came to that so no I don't only real lethal guns just simply because I have never wanted to bother to jump through the hoops enough to get one and I know because I've got a gun safe you know I could go clay pigeon a couple of times and get a shotgun no problem uh, saying clay pigeon but again I don't really want it gathering dust if I'm not going to use it much that's the reason I don't have them um, gun licenses. Mr. Jeffrey 2486 says, what do you think about nuclear weapon, weapon, I guess he yeah, means nuclear weapons, should we have it in this world? Yeah, I think, although, I'll we'll see if they all got used, it would be the end of everything and it would be absolutely horrible if you haven't seen Fred's, watch Fred's all the day after, you know, those sorts of movies, um, like the realistic sort of portrayals of nuclear war. Um, as much as it's bad in that sense, if you know much about the history of the Cold War, 
Um, the reason we didn't have World War Three was because of nuclear weapons. When both sides had a gun to their head, everybody kind of played nice and they only fought proxy wars rather than legitimately, you know, actually going at it. So I think overall nuclear weapons have saved a lot of lives. If you know much about the end of World War II, um, America bombing uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki of nuclear, although they were atomic, not hydrogen bombs, actually did save a lot of lives in the long run. That's very controversial to say that apparently, but a ground invasion of Japan would have been much bloodier than uh, using you know, the doomsday weapons and nukes to uh, basically um, force Japan's hand um, into surrender. Um, some people have said, oh, you know, it's really evil and that, but they never seem to make a fuss about the firebombing of Tokyo, which actually killed more people than Hiroshima. You know, so it's always stuff like that I find a bit weird. It seems to be most of the people who are very anti, you know, nuclear weapons in World War II didn't actually read into the conflict much and haven't looked at some of the other nasty things that went on in the war. You know, so they're fine with conventional bombing or firebombing, but they suddenly find nuclear weapons to be much, you know, more not tasteful, I don't know. I've also heard people say, why didn't they drop a nuclear bomb over the sea to show Japan they had it? Well, when they bombed Hiroshima, Japan didn't want to surrender because they thought the Americans only had one bomb. So, you know, that's an invalid argument, really, isn't it? Awesome Cameraman says, what would you rather own, Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum or Colt M1911? Definitely the Colt M1911. M1911. Actually, um, designed by John Moses Browning. I don't know if a lot of people, I don't think, know that. Uh, John Moses John Moses Browning uh, was a really um, prolific firearms inventor and designer. He, Browning did loads of guns, the Browning High Power, 1911. He also did like the Browning Automatic Rifle, um, both the Browning Heavy Machine Guns, so the Browning M2, which was a 50 cal, and the Browning, I think it's M1919, which was the 30 caliber one. Um, you know, like the 30 aught 6 one. Uh, he designed that as well. There's quite a few other guns he designed as well. You know, Browning is, if you look at a list of lots of famous guns from the early 20th century, his name's like on all of them, nearly. So yeah, uh, definitely the M1911. If you gave me the choice, I'd rather actually have a Browning High Power, but out of, uh, you know, a Smith & Wesson 44 or another, you know, like, six-shot revolver magnum, I'd definitely have a M1911 pistol. Len H says, my other question I assume he asked the question on another video and I've repeated this one. My other question is, what is your favourite non-firearm weapon? Good question. I assume we're going to like ignore tanks and things like that and just um, assume it to be like small arms. Probably like a good sword or something like that. I mean, I'd say maybe a falchion because, you know, I actually paid a load of money to have a falchion made for me. Um, rather than just buying, you know, like a made in China factory one, I actually had one commissioned. Um, I like a lot of crossbows as well, but I'd say yeah, falchion, like a lot of swords I find really cool, there's a lot of other swords I like as well, but the falchion was the one I designed, you know, decided I liked how the sword was laid out, you know, and the history behind them and all that, so yeah, I'd say the falchion's probably my favourite non-firearm weapon. Tumbo1984, um, I've cut a bit off of his question because that's, was I didn't want to make this, you know, small onto loads of pages. Because um, I answered one of his questions and he said a more specific question would be in relation to the Stauhelm, I assume he means my uh, East German M56 Stauhelm, and the Mark 1 79 Ballistic Nylon Combo, because I've said before, you know, when I set up Body Armour uh, a while ago, if you could look on my channel a few years ago, I had the East German Helmet, the Stauhelm, and I had the, um, you know, British Army Northern Ireland Ballistic Vest because um, they were the best things at the time I had. In light of new purchases, would you change them? Yeah. With the ballistic vest, I'd change that to this, and then if I wanted to, the ballistic vest actually fits over the top of this, so that would give me, you know, extra protection and more cushioning. If I could afford a plate carrier, you know, or, some, or better armour than this, I'd have got better armour than this at the moment. You know, like, this is good enough for what I want. At some point, I'll probably invest and choose something else to replace this. In relation, relation to the East German helmet, um, what I'd ideally like is I kind of want a riot helmet that has the visor to, pre to protect your face in case, you know, somebody throws acid or something in your face, which I think is quite likely now in this country. Uh, so, what I'd probably want is either with my Mark VI helmet to find a visor that clips onto it and, you know, have that with a visor, or ideally have something like a Pascot helmet because that's better protection than the Mark VI helmet or the British Mark VII helmet with a riot visor. 
again, they can be quite expensive to get, so I've not, you know, got any of those yet, just simply due to the price factors. But yeah, this vest I've got on would definitely replace the, you know, Mark 1 ballistic vest if I didn't have that on top of this for extra protection. King282 says, if you could own one gun, what would it be? Mine would be a PKP. Is this like, if I could own the gun and I could get ammo for it, like no question, like unlimited ammo for that gun, because like obviously there'd be pricing problems with some guns if you had a really interesting gun, the ammunition. I'd be tempted to say an SLR, because I've got one, you know, I bought an SLR because I think they're really cool guns, the old fouls. But if I could own any gun, maybe I'd want like a really, one of the really well made AK-74s or something. Stuff on. I think I'm just going to go with the SLR because I really like it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's loads of guns I could go for. I find it hard to choose, you know, like I said before, if I was in America, I'd definitely, you know, when I had spare money, I'd definitely keep buying lots and lots of guns to, you know, hoard and shoot. That'd be quite good fun. But yeah, for what it'd be at the moment, it'd be an SLR. Emo Joe says, Are you a prepper? And if so, do you have a bug in or bug out kit? Um, I've sort of said about this before, but. I'm kind of like a pseudo prepper. I have some, like, I have food reserves, I have water reserves, you know, like bottled water, canned food, and, you know, like, food that just doesn't go off stored in the house. Um, and I said, I've got, like, you know, defensive armaments that I've definitely considered. But I'm not like a prepper that's, you know, considered every eventuality and what I could do. So I've kind of got, like, I've sort of talked about it before, but I definitely think I ought to do an updated video on it because I've changed it quite a bit. I have had, like, bags set up before for, like, bug-out gear in it, but I think I'm more likely to bug in. The part of the country I'm in is not so totally screwed at the moment. But in a country the size of the UK, I don't think you're going to really be safe anywhere unless you're in the Scottish Highlands or somewhere, like, very remote Wales or remote Yorkshire or somewhere like that. So, um, yeah, I don't think in my area there's going to be much good I could do bugging out, so it's more bugging. So then you don't need all the stuff set up in bags so much if you're in your house as long as you know where it is and get to it quickly. But yeah, as I said, I'm a sort of prepper. I take what I think is common sense, you know, practical prepping options. And then some people go beyond that, which is absolutely fine if that's what they want to do. Um, I think they're in some ways quite sensible. But, I, you know, for a lot of people it's where do you draw the line financially and, you know, time-wise. And I think having a couple of weeks worth of food and water and stuff to defend yourself with is, you know, for me, what I consider sensible. Um, Bread Boy says, do you think all civilians should be allowed to carry a weapon with them? For example, pepper spray, knife, BB, air pistol. Yeah, I said before, I support the Second Amendment in America, so I think people should be allowed to, uh, you know, carry firearms on them. But yeah, things like pepper spray, they're completely sensible, because, you know, pepper spray doesn't even kill anybody, I guess, unless they have some very horrible allergic reaction to it. And there's a lot of ways you could defend yourself with pepper spray. But <clears throat> we live in a country where often you could be a criminal. You could carry a weapon with intent and get a very light sentence. But if you carry something for self-defense, you can be thrown under the bus by the law. So I think, you know, as a common sense thing, all people should be allowed to defend themselves. Um, Oleg Itchalaninov. Itchalaninov. Sorry if I'm probably butchering the name. Some gas masks have two filter intakes. If you have two filters on a gas mask, would that would that make you breathe easier? Yeah, if you have two filters on a mask as opposed to one filter, um, you're getting half your air intake from each side, so the breathing resistance goes down. The filters last longer as well, because each filter's having to do less work, but then obviously you need to replace two filters when you replace the filter, not one filter. But yeah, dual filters are just simply done because it makes breathing resistance easier and each filter lasts a bit longer. Um, a few other people asked really similar questions to that, so I've only I'm going to answer it once where I've answered Oleg with it, but yeah, two filters make breathing easier, um, but obviously you do have to replace both filters when they start wearing out. Sargopnik said, out of all the gas masks you know of, which one is the best in protection and style? From what I've heard, the good models of Canadian C4 gas masks are like one of the best masks you can get if you can get a hold of them. Uh, for what I've got, the Avon FM12 and CT12 are my favourite masks and style. Um, oh, if you mean absolute best in protection everything, then you'd need a um, closed circuit kind of breathing system or a, um, you know, like oxygen tank 
with air going into the masks that give better protection using a filter but if you just mean like filters on a gas mask then any of like the quite good modern gas masks would do it, respirators would do it um, for style I personally prefer two smaller eyepieces than having a visor kind of panoramic lens because I find them often you can't aim very well with a panoramic lens because they stick out too far um, Bug Out Basic says, do you use lighter fluid of petroleum for Zippos? Or maybe you meant all petroleum. I generally use lighter fluid. I've tried a few things. I've generally found lighter fluid works the best. In Poundland you can buy um, a bottle of lighter fluid that's roughly the same size as Zippo one, like 300 milliliters or whatever it is, for um, about a pound. Well, it would be a pound in Poundland, but I was wondering if the size is slightly different, might be a bit smaller. But yeah, you can generally cheaply buy in bulk lighter fluid that lasts ages, so I've just kind of considered that's the best way of doing it. I think if you're really dedicated, there's some raw ingredients you can buy and mix together that work just as well as lighter fluid that work out cheap in bulk. But for me, just buying a load of cans of lighter fluid is convenient, and you can store them easily as lighter fluid canisters. Um, Hunterdom556, or, Hunter or Hunted Tom, says... What was your first air gun? Uh, the Crossman Nitro Venom, if you look at some of the earliest videos on my channel, it's in that. Crossman Nitro Venom was really good. Sadly, the barrel's a bit bent now, so I've had to shim the scope massively to work with it, and really, I ought to get another sort of decent mid-range air gun. Um, but yeah, it's a brake barrel. It's a nitro piston one rather than being a spring. Really good air gun when it was working fine, but over years of use and abusing it a little bit, I bent the barrel. So it's not perfect now, but yeah, they are very good air guns. They have a 20mm weaver rail, which is nice, because it means it's easier to find scope mounts for it than um, dovetail, which is a bit antiquated. Mike Doherty says, Have you ever fouled a tree, or do you do any woodworking? I was absolutely crap at woodworking when we did DT at school. I was a bit better on the metalworking, but I you know, did not get on with woodworking at all. I have chopped down like little small trees and bushes and things, but I've never fouled a proper big tree, no, like a lumberjack. Um... Again, woodworking is one of those really practical skills that's obviously good to know, but I'm just a bit crap at it, and I think, you know, there's things I could put my time into learning, I could probably pick up other skills a bit faster than woodworking. So, no, I'm crap at woodworking. I've never cut down any big trees, so I'm not really a lumberjack or a good uh, carpenter. Sam Baker said, Would you consider doing historical reenacting, and if so, what period would you do? Out of the reenacting, I think would be the most fun to do uh, would be either be where you do the kind of medieval one where people are in all the armour and they just beat the crap out of each other with just blunt swords. That looks quite fun. Um, but I think the ones I'd quite like is where the people do the quite modern era, like World War One, World War Two, forward sort of reenacting. Well, I've seen some reenactors doing that before, and it's quite good when you've got you know the machine guns all firing blanks. That's actually an easy way to get hold of a firearm if you do reenacting. There are ways that you can um, buy rifles if you're only using them with blanks. Um, you know, that way. Um, but yeah, I haven't really considered doing reenacting, to be honest, because I've looked around, there's not loads of stuff where I am. And, like, you know, I've got other things to do with my time, because uh, I do um, do amateur dramatics, and that's, like, one of the things where I'd probably have to sacrifice that to do reenacting, you know, other stuff like that. I think it's quite interesting reenacting. I like watching like watching reenactors, but um, you know I've never really seriously considered it because I've got too much stuff to do really. Um, David Boy two seven seven. He asked two questions. These were from last week, um, and I've put them again in this one. The first question is his silly one. He says, "Would you rather poo out of your mouth or have taste buds on your anus?" I think out of the two taste buds on your anus because if you put out your mouth you're going to taste it on your tongue anyway and you're going to have to keep cleaning all the crap out of your teeth which would be a bit vile. Imagine if you had diarrhea. Just <laughs> so yeah, I'd rather have taste buds on my anus but I'd rather not have either, you know. Um, and he says, serious question now, if you live with anyone, what do, you f what do, what do they think of your collections? I live with my parents, I just simply can't afford to live anywhere else because I live in the Oxford area next to London, that's like the most expensive part of the UK to live in. Um, if you were to buy like a one bedroom house around here, one or two bedroom houses and normally for over 300 grand for ones that aren't even in that good condition, renting is stupid money because so many students want to go to Oxford Uni, a lot of the places now there's not even that much normal rented accommodation or private accommodation because lots of you know places buy it just to rent out purely to students because they can make so much money doing it 
So if I moved out, I'd have to move out somewhere completely else in the UK, and I'd probably have to house share with people. Because I don't personally see the point in moving out if you're going to spend so much on rent that, you know, you've got no actual savings coming in. Um, at least in my parents' house, because it's a fairly decently big-sized house and a nice garden, I've got lots of room for all my crap. You know, my parents don't really charge me much rent because I think they like having me around to fix problems for them when they don't know how to do stuff on computers, you know, and they need some more manual labour done. So, yeah, um, get back to the question. Um, I think they think my collection's fine. They probably thought it was a bit weird at first, but they realised, you know, my YouTube stuff does quite well. People are interested in it. So, you know, they think that's a bit cool, really. Um, yeah, I think they wish it didn't take up so much room all in the house where all the gas masks are here, there, and everywhere, but, yeah. Uh, Retrover6 says, do you smoke? Are you interested in travelling? And how many which countries have you been to? Right, I'll cover the travelling one first. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely interested in travelling. I've been to a lot of places. I've said before, I'd definitely like to go to America, do some shooting in America, but it's all about saving up the money to go, and, you know, sometimes the money's a bit tight regardless, so I've not been able to save up to go to America. But countries I've been to... Um, I've been to quite a few places in the UK, I've been to Scotland, Wales, I don't think I've ever been to Ireland, if I have it's been when I've young, I've been to like the Isle of Wight and places, you know, so I've been all around the UK. Um, I've been to France, I have been to Germany, I have been to Spain, I have been to Madeira which is owned by Portugal, I've been to Spain several times. I have been to Austria, I've already said Germany haven't I, I've been to Norway and Finland. I've been to Greece, I've been to Poland, I've been to Slovakia, I've been to the Czech Republic, I've also been to Hungary, might have even forgotten some places, but, you know, I've gone to quite a lot of places, to be honest, compared to a lot of people, mostly all around Europe. I've never been really out of Europe properly. Uh, as I said, I would like to go to America and Canada, I think that'd be great, but it's affording to do it and things like that. So I haven't been further afield than that. And do you smoke? Um, now, I might not be able to be completely open on this one, just simply due to the fact that apparently there are laws coming in in the UK, like, you know, more draconian bullshit. And if you smoke, they're going to charge you more money if you have to have any, like, surgery done or that, even if it's not related to smoking. So, as much as I have enjoyed cigars, to answer your question that one, no, I do not smoke because of financial reasons that may be forced upon me if I admit to ever smoking anything even if it's not a lot. Um, what I do do, um, I do have like vape stuff, uh, I'm not really addicted because this, I know a lot of people would say they're not addicted and they are addicted, but um, even when I've smoked, you know, I've never actually had the urge if it's a rainy day to go outside and smoke, I'll sort of sort that out, stay indoors. Um, I quite, I think nicotine is quite good, especially if you're not having all the dangers with tobacco because um, nicotine has a few interesting health effects that have kind of been brushed aside that you should read into. Um, you know, that's quite interesting to read. But what I've got in here is CBD at the moment, because that's been legalised in the UK now. And CBD is, you can get from cannabis and hemp. CBD is um, like the non-psychoreactive part, it's not the THC. And CBD is meant to be good for lots and lots of illnesses, some of them are you know, which I suffer from, but you know, there's a massive list of things that CBD does that's good for the human body. But for a very long time, because of the stigma of, you know, cannabis and weed, um, CBD has not been legalised. Out of all the crap the UK does, um, they have legalised CBD now. So I've got CBD in here. And um, CBD is really good stuff. Even the short time I've been using it, I've noticed some stuff that's, you know, just improved with me. Um, so much stuff that I don't think it can be a placebo effect, but CBD is expensive. Um, 10 millilitres of it is about 20 quid at the moment. I'm hoping competition is going to bring the prices down eventually, but CBD is great. You know, I have normal e-liquids of various fruit flavours of nicotine in, and I've got the CBD. But yeah, the CBD... really good to vape and it has a lot of health um, effects so if you're in the UK look into getting CBD now it's been legalized because it you know does have a lot of good things about it that you know have kind of been covered up 
Um, and now a lot of doctors and you know scientists have put pressure on certain governments to legalize CBD. Um, so yeah, get CBD or look into getting CBD if you're in the UK because you can legally get it now. Dicker Licker, <laughs> that's a good name, says, what is your favorite car? Um, well, I drive a Mark IV Golf at the moment, GTI, and I love that to bits. It's 17 years old. It has to have you know, worked on it quite often now because of the age it's got to, but I really enjoy driving that. Um, what I'd really like is if I could have that almost as a new car again where everything works perfectly on it and, you know, all the door seals are great because where the cars got old, you know, it's like where it, fo you know, fogs up constantly inside now like most old cars do because, um, you know, the rubber seals probably aren't very good on the doors and everything. Uh, what's my favourite car? I mean, assuming you don't mean, like, really overpriced sports cars and things... What I'd quite like to have is probably another hot hatch, um, maybe like the current, like the Mark 7 R Golf, because that's like 0 to 60 in under 5 seconds. Um, you know, but the thing I don't like about a lot of modern cars is how they put so much computer crap in them, because the computer crap can go wrong. In my old Citroen C3, I had a Citroen C3 that was in really good condition, I'd still be driving that now, but the computer went wrong. And the price of getting the computer fixed to make the car, you know, usable, so the central locking work properly and everything else, um, ended up being over several grand, so I ended up selling the car for that reason. Um, and that's one of the things that makes me a bit sceptical about modern cars, where they have all the stupid computers in them. If I could get something that's not strictly a car, you know, and I had no problem keeping it on the road and parts and everything like that, I'd love to get an old armoured car, something like a Humber Pig or a BTR 152. You know, one of, I'd really like one of those old sort of retro armoured cars. Um, but yeah, for practicality reasons, if I could have any car, I'd probably really like to have a um, something like either, yeah, the Mark 7 Golf R, uh, Subaru Impreza, like the top model there, I've probably butchered the name of that, or um, like a Honda Civic, you know, the fastest model of that. I quite like smaller cars because they're easier to park and you can, you know, fit down narrow roads easier with them, they're more economical on fuel as well, even for the more sporty models, um, and yeah, you can get generally get some good 0-60s out of them and things like that. Mad Dog Survival says, my question would be, what would your opinion be on the UK having a form of Second Amendment type policy? As I said before, I totally approve of Second Amendment, I reckon you should just be able to buy any gun, whatever, because criminals always get their hands on guns anyway, and people who want to kill each other do it with knives and whatever else. Um, if they did have to make it more limited, I'd say limit people to carrying six round revolvers. Like, they could carry more ammunition on them, but that way, you know, it'd be a bit slower for them to load the revolvers if they went on a shooting spree, and you could make it so they could only have up to certain calibres, so it'd be hard to shoot through body armour like this. If you wanted to go down that route, but I'm personally open for everybody owning whatever, as long as they're sensible with their guns. Because, as I said, criminals will get their hands on them regardless. So having laws that only restrict freedom-loving good people is stupid. The NS Weeaboo says, Do you think the British Army moved from 762 to five, uh, 762, you know, NATO, to 556 NATO was a mistake? And that 6mm, 6.8mm alternative with a slightly lower muzzle velocity but higher mass would have been superior. Um, yeah, I think, especially when they did move from 762, so what the British Army did was it basically got rid of all, all its fouls overnight, the SLRs. It went to the L85A1, which was a dreadful rifle. The L85A2 is supposedly quite good, where they fixed a lot of the problems with it. But the A1 was, you know, a gun that fell apart. It jammed constantly. It had so many problems. Supposedly the best thing about it was the sight. <laughs> so that, you know, and the SUSAT sight on the L85 as well was really heavy, apparently. So, you know, when you've got a really heavy sight and that's considered the best part of your gun, and that's uh, a bad thing. What they should have done is waited till they had a good 5.56 rifle, and then they should have had mixed units with, like, 75% 5.56 rifles, 25% 7.62 battle rifles with, you know, mag decent magnification scopes. So you can gauge close range and long range targets with a mixed fire team like the Soviets used to do, where they had guys with Mosin the Gants or Dragonovs and the rest of the guys with AKs and then guys with heavy machine guns for longer range shooting as well. That's a much better way of doing mixed, you know, score combat. As for the 6mm rounds, I don't know. Yeah, it sounds like they would have been good, but I think you're never going to really get a jack-of-all-trades rifle. I think it's best to have a good mix of, you know, like 5.56 and 7.62 and fire teams. He also says, do you like anime? Never watched it. 
Um, I do like some of the old Disney animated stuff, not like the modern stuff, but where they you know had the really well drawn stuff. Some anime I like might like, I've never bothered watching it. I watch a lot of old movies, so I don't really have time to watch it to be honest. Org Drone ninety eight said, What would be your best setup for defensive loadout, clothes, gear, protection, weaponry? Um probably Flecton type stuff. I ought to do some more videos on this because it probably interests people and I could go into a lot more detail. Flecton like camo or mismatch camo with stuff like MTP and Flecton because I like both those camo palettes. I like Strickton as well. So, you know, generally good camos for my environment. Gear, probably soft body armor rather than going full plate carrier. If I did go for full plate carrier, I wouldn't want too many plates in so I get a good weight distribution between soft armor and heavy armor or hard armor. Um, Ideally, I'd like, you know, something like a foul um, with lots of ammo and maybe a low power scope on it. Um, but if I, you know, had to follow UK stuff, it would just be stuff like 105 pound crossbows, variety of, variety of knives and machetes and stuff like that. Again, I'll do more videos on that because I think that would interest people. So that's a very good question. Thank you. That guy said, if you could remove one gas mask from history whatever that be to stop clones or if or if it just bugs you etc what would you remove and why I don't think I'd like to remove anything from a historical perspective because I like collecting and even the masks that are crap but I think the US should never have adopted the M17 I think the US should have carried on with 60 or gone to 40 millimeter masks and that would have made you know more of the clone masks more interesting and practical because cheek filter masks are stupid but if they got rid of cheek filter masks we'd probably never had the XM28 or the PBF which I actually like but yeah Remove the M17 if we had to remove a gas mask. Ethan Shaw says, What is the scariest experience you ever had with a gas mask? Years ago, before I knew much about them, my friend had an SHM41, um, and he had the coffee can filter, which contains asbestos. This is like a double bad. Put it on, didn't realise there's a rubber plug in the bottom. It's a tight mask, so I nearly suffocated myself with that one. So, you know, that wasn't a um, brilliant experience. So I guess that's my scariest experience with a gas mask, but obviously I'm alive. I didn't suffocate myself, I did manage to get it off. But yeah, always check, it sounds silly, but always check if you've got a filter that is unplugged before you put it on. Um, Worst Coffee Ever says, what's your favourite novel and author? I really like Richard Matheson stuff, I mostly read non-fiction, but I really like Richard Matheson stuff. If you haven't read, read Richard Matheson, I advise you to check him out. Let me just get a couple of his books, I've got them on my shelf. I Am Legend by Richard Matheson is a really good book. It's pretty much the book that started the zombie genre, especially because the first film based on it, The Last Man on Earth with Vincent Price, very much um, was reminiscent of Night of the Living Dead. I think Romero actually said, you know, he did copy it for Night of the Living Dead. Um, he also, because um, this is quite a short book, it's almost a novella rather than a full novel. Um, How House by him is also really good, quite a creepy book. Um, the film The Legend of How House is really good if you haven't seen that. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend Richard Matheson. He wrote a lot of things for The Twilight Zone and stuff like that. His book's very good. I'm actually going to reread How House because I reread I Am Legend quite recently. I also like stuff like George Orwell, 1984. You know, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, Brave New World by Audrex Huxley, or however his name's pronounced. I quite like a lot of dystopian fiction, but as I said, I'm going to reread Owl House. Probably that's going to be the next book I read, I think. VS says, What's your stance on conscription? Would it have a positive impact on British society if all male citizens had to serve in the armed forces? I think the national service system a few countries do where they give you like a pacifist option and like a combat option where you could do military service and potentially see combat um, for a short period or you could do you know like handing out foreign aid or peacekeeping or something um, as another option is good um, I don't know if it's necessarily good to force a lot of people into it I think it would teach people very good life skills that people apparently don't know anymore um, but I think the schooling system and everything needs to be fixed. And, you know, I think it would be good if the teachers could still hit kids at school. Because when I was at school, you know, there was times where I'd not pay attention. Maybe getting a smack would have taught me a good, you know, some things. I know some people are very against hitting kids, but if it's done right, I think it's a good thing. Um, and also, you know, um, I think a lot of teachers as well need to make schools, like, actually fun, you know, fun for the kids to learn. Because I think if you have a fun time learning you would actually remember some of the stuff and take it away, but when, you know, teachers just kind of blah, 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 this is your lesson, blah, 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 it's boring, kids don't want to be there, that makes them, you know, become more likely to be delinquents and everything, I think, if you make school really boring for them and force them to go. 
Um, but yeah, I think if they had national service, um, I think if you're already in some sort of good employment job, um, you'd have the option of not doing it, simply because it's, it'd be a shame if you were doing you know, a good job and then you had to do national service and you had to lose your job because of that. Um, but I think in many ways it would be good. Um, but you know, there's no way Britain could facilitate that now, considering we barely have an army or a navy or an air force or anything left now. It's all been cut to pieces. Um, so yeah, I think if impl implemented right, it could be good. But you know, if you implement it wrongly, it would be horrible. But in the event of a big war, obviously conscription is necessary to defend your country. Nameless Goon says another question: If it's fine and isn't already asked, favorite movies. My favourite movie, I think, this is one I only found out about a year or so ago and I've talked about it before, is Della Morte Della More, or Cemetery Man. Um, it's kind of like a very dark comedy movie about a guy who works in a graveyard and all these zombies keep coming back to life and he has to shoot them and then the feel, film just gets weirder and weirder from there. Really good film. Um, what other movies do I like? I like a lot of 80s, you know, pointless action movies. Uh, I like a lot of the Schwarzenegger ones and... Um, I've been watching a lot of the Chuck Norris films that Canon did recently, a lot of them are good fun, like the Delta Force is great and all those, uh, Missing in Action series is great. Um, my favourite war movie of all time is probably Where Eagles Dare, if you haven't seen Where Eagles Dare, watch Where Eagles Dare, it's not very realistic, but it's a great film, it's not that accurate to the book either, because in the book they only kill a couple of Germans in the film, it's like 100 plus German body count, but um, yeah. I'm sure there's lots of other films I could think of I really like that, you know, aren't popping into my mind like right now. Della Morte, Della More is definitely my favourite film. Um, UK Survivor says, for the next Q&A, do you think children in school should be taught about civil defence and what governments do in these situations? Yeah, I think people, again, like I said, there's lots of life skills people don't learn, you know, like safety things. What we should do, I think, is like what the Russia does, and I think they did in the Soviet Union as well, where you actually get people paid to do civil defence type jobs, so to train people in civil defence, to, you know, run civil defence shelters. In the UK, civil defence is kind of like a volunteer organisation that not many people are members of. Um, but I think, you know, if it was actually a paid-for job, lots of people would do it, and they probably learn good skills from it and then teach those skills to more people. Um, but if they did teach them what the governments do in these situations, the, gov the such thing would be the government will kill you or do nothing because that's what my war emergency guidebook says and again I am going to get a video done on the war emergency guidebook and I'll stick it on Patreon for the people who support me on there because as I said it's a bit of a dodgy thing for me to actually do so if I do it I'll put it on Patreon for the people who directly support me um, Jacob Dagger says who does the Falklands belong to? Uh, the Falklands Island, Falkland Islands belong to the Falkland Islanders and they have said time and time again in votes that they want it to stay part of Britain I've actually spoken to quite a few people from Argentina on this channel and what a lot of people have said to me on there, which is quite interesting, is the Falklands, or what they call it, Las Malvinas, or something, Malvinas, something like that, it only gets brought up over there when there's a politician who's not very popular and they need to make a scapegoat and they use the Falklands as, you know, a scapegoat for why they're not doing well. Kind of a bit like it was used over here, but... I said, let the Falkland Islanders keep voting on who they want to keep control of. If they vote for Argentina, let Argentina have it. But they vote for protection from the British Empire. Um, if they voted for independence and another nation guaranteed their independence, which might be kind of how it is now, uh, do it that way. But, you know, the Falkland Islanders, the people who live on there, have voted for Britain to, um, you know, keep control of it for now. So for now, let's respect their decision to do that. Mario Gonzalez says, what is your favourite combat helmet? Out of the retro ones, I like these German M56, because the Stauhelm, it kind of has that traffic cone, almost phallus look to it, but it was the best of the steel helmets, because, you know, it had like almost a 45 degree slope to it. Um, so it offered the best ballistic protection out of all the old helmets. Out of my favourite combat helmets, full stop though, what I'd really love is those um, Spetsnaz massive titanium helmets with like the visor on that look kind of like medieval knight's helmets, but they, you know, offer the best level of protection out of any of the helmets. And they'd be really cool. Sadly, to buy them over here, when they rarely turn up, they're like 300 plus, plus pounds, so I can never justify buying one. But I'd love to get a helmet like that. Connor Lang says, what is your favourite colour? Orange. I've always liked orange as a colour. Don't know why. I can't really answer a question like that. But yeah, orange is a great colour. I like orange. And last but not least, Jack Stryker says, my question is, do you think you would have any trouble mentally dispatching any foes in without rule of law? Would you shoot first and ask questions later? 
Well, for the first one, I don't think if it, you know, came to me or them, I'd have much trouble. And the reason I say that is, like, I've had to euthanise animals before, which is something obviously you would not enjoy doing if you've had to do it. But I think if you can euthanise a cute animal that's in pain, you know, for the best possible reasons, then to kill somebody who's trying to kill you first would give you no problem. I think afterwards you might have, you know, mental problems afterwards, you know, considering that you've done it. Um, but, you know, I've been in situations where, you know, I've had to do stuff, you know, euthanise animals, which is always a bit shitty, so... If it came to where somebody was attacking me and wanted to kill me, obviously I don't think I'd have any problem doing it because I've already had to take lives, just not human ones. And then if it was, you know, me or them, I find that quite easy. I think it's just afterwards you might, you know, it might get your head a bit afterwards once you've done it. And he also says, would you shoot first, ask questions later? I think, yeah, if you've bugged out somewhere, you're in the middle of nowhere, you've got your own thing set up and you've got like a fence and you've probably got signs saying trespassers will be shot. If somebody's coming, it's probably best to shoot first, ask questions later, because you don't know what they're going to try. You know, if you leave it too late and they do try something, then you're a dead man, aren't you? So, yeah, I think, ideally, I'd just like to be out in the middle of the countryside, no, you know, in the middle of nowhere, on my um, reinforced, you know, hypothetically reinforced uh, kind of farmhouse type thing. Um, you know, big perimeter fence and wall, signs warning people not to trespass if they trespass. <laughs> Yep, so thanks for the questions everybody. Whether or not I do one next week depends on how many more questions I've got, because I don't think I've got any more questions I didn't put on this one that were really good questions. If I've not answered a question or you can think of more good ones, leave them in the comments and I'll try and answer them. Um, if I don't get enough questions, I'll leave it a bit longer before doing a video and I'll do another random video on Sunday. Um, but thanks for all the really good questions from people. Um, and I've enjoyed doing these videos as usual. So, yeah, thanks for the questions.